you very much. Um, so yeah, thank you, thank you very much for that introduction. So yeah, this is a workshop for practical mobile app attacks by example. So I'm the CEO of Tevini Security. Uh, if you like this workshop, you can also see a, a lot of public contest reports on the website. So if you go to 70 security.com and publications, there's a lot of uh, public contest reports that you can read for free. This is a very quick way to learn uh, without any uh, without any money about security um, because these are basically uh, real report PDFs that have been uh, published online. Uh, we have delivered training at Black Hat USA, Hacking the Box, OWASP Global AppSec, Nullcon, Hackfest, uh, and many other events. Uh, I have also been um, a team lead and a penetration Thursday at Q53 and version one. Uh, I wrote a course for eLearn Security a while back called Practical Web Defense. I'm one of the um, project leaders of OWASP OWTF. So if you are a student and you want to get paid this summer, uh, for um, the Google Summer of Code. Uh, OWASP has been accepted. So this is not just for OWASP or WTF, but if you're interested in any OWASP project, uh, get in touch with the relevant uh, OWASP leader uh, as soon as possible, because you could uh, make some money while you work on some open source project if you are a university student. Uh, other presentations that I have delivered can be seen on this link. Uh, and then I was a developer first, and then I switched to security, so I can can like understand both worlds, right? Like the attack the the attack side and the defense side. So um, and I know how to speak to both uh, audiences, right? So if you like uh, this presentation, I think uh, these public pentest reports and presentations might be interesting to you. Uh, the first half of the slide is about Smart Sheriff. So we will see some vulnerabilities in this uh, application. So basically this was a mobile application that was mandated in the entire country of South Korea. So by law, every parent and child in the country of South Korea, so this is the good Korea, right? Not the communist one. This is the, the one in the South, right? The uh, democratic and everything else. So in this place, uh, by law, every parent and child were forced to install an application uh, where the parent would control during what times of the day the child would be allowed to use the phone, what websites they should be allowed to visit and things like that. Uh, and then we were asked to audit this application. So we pen tested the application twice um, and the results were so catastrophically bad that we even gave a presentation about it. So if you search YouTube, for Smart Sheriff Dam Idea, you can watch this presentation and these are the two pen test reports. So if you want to learn about mobile security, if you check these two pen test reports, you will see a lot of uh, a lot of vulnerabilities in mobile applications because pretty much everything that could be, do uh, uh, could be done wrong was done wrong in this application, right? So it's really spectacular, like the, <laughs> the level of catastrophic failure of this. And then the last three are more kind of privacy related. So here we were trying to help some human rights activists that were trying to figure out what kind of data is being gathered by um, some uh, applications used by the Chinese government. Most of these are related, well, the, these two here are related to monitoring uh, Muslim minorities. And then the study of the great nation is like at the entire population level of the country. They were like awarding points depending on how much you know about the great leader and things like this. Um, so yeah, you can check those uh, Pentas reports. And there's also a YouTube present, uh, a presentation about this that uh, it's on YouTube now. So if you search YouTube for Chinese police and cloud pets, you will see um, some of the context of these uh, pen tests and stuff as well. So these are more kind of privacy related and these are more security related. And there's a lot more public pen test reports on the website so you can check all these to learn about mobile security. So today we are going to, uh, uh, I'm going to walk you through a lot of vulnerabilities that we have found uh, over many years in mobile applications. So we are going to see many different vulnerability patterns and then I will ask you like if you can spot the vulnerability or not. So we will play this game a little bit. Uh, now, since we only have two hours, um, I will have to like skip some details like mitigation details, for example, I'll just uh, skip some parts like that so that we have enough time. But otherwise, uh, we will go through the entire presentation and then in the training portal, uh, everybody who shared their email address have, have already been invited. But at the end of the presentation, I will tell you 
how you can get access to all the materials, as well as a four hour recording for this same workshop where everything is explained a little bit more relaxed than, <laughs> than what I'm going to do today, right? So but yeah, we're going to play this game about uh, what is the vulnerability. Now this uh, offer, uh, since this presentation was given before, is kind of uh, out of the question. However, uh, you will still have lifetime access to all uh, workshop materials, including the vulnerable apps to work with. Right? So first, let's start with some uh, sexy denial of service attack, right? So the scenario here was a mobile application using a tracking library, right? So one of those libraries to try to figure out what the user is doing and collect the information from the app. So does anybody know what this command does? Any guesses about that? Check the chat. Um, all reference links. Um, the crypting file based encryption is, is similar to a reverse shell but uh, is not really uh, is not really a reverse shell, right? But it's kind of similar, right? So this is uh, similar to Netcat. So SBD is a Netcat clone. So it's a, a tool that is very similar to uh, to Netcat. And what it's doing is uh, it's the dash R zero means that there's going to be a delay of zero seconds if the server uh, crashes to be respawned again, right? So normally if Netcat crashes, uh, you have to start it manually again. So in this case, with SBD, you can have this automatic restart. Then does C off means that there's no encryption. And then the rest of the parameters is the same as Netcat. So uh, dash N to avoid DNS resolution, V for verbose, uh, L for listening, and P to listen on TCP ports. So it's listening on TCP port 80, and then it's going to execute with the dash E, the yes command. And the yes command is basically, yes, it's running the yes command instead of being sh. So whatever connects to this port, uh, to this server on port 80 is going to get the output of the yes command. And the yes command, if you are not familiar, is a command that is just saying yes, 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 a lot of times. So, um, so what this is going to do is, uh, is basically going to send a lot of data to whatever connects to it. So. Uh, what happened with this was that um, since the library uh, using DNS spoofing, we could redirect the traffic from um, the intended um, uh, library server, where the library was trying to track user requests to uh, an attacker controlled server. And then when the application connected to this, then it was receiving a lot of data because of the yes command. So this is the crash in iOS for the application. So it cannot uh, allocate enough memory, and then it crashes, right? So this would be on the left uh, normal usage. You can see it's 50 megabytes of memory, and then this is on the crash. So it has, it is using almost one gigabyte of memory, uh, and this is like the crash here, right? So it's a denial of service using memory consumption. Right, the fixes, uh, you can watch the longer recording for, for this. I'm just going to skip them because there's like a lot of cool vulnerabilities that I think you will enjoy in this presentation, right? So now, understand the next series of attacks that I'm going to explain, we have to talk about uh, the SD card on Android, right? So on Android, the SD card is what I call the, the Wild West of security because um, there's, there's several factors, right? So uh, on Android, when an application can read and write to the SD card, it can read and write anywhere on the SD card, including directories from other applications, right? So if an application saves sensitive data uh, on the SD card, then there can be several problems. One is the scenario of a malicious application installed on the phone. So in that case, that malicious application can read and write anything in there. Uh, and then the other scenario would be where um, for example, a thief uh, steals the phone and then without any magical uh, technical knowledge or anything like this, uh, they can just extract the SD card from the phone. Like in most uh, Android phones, this is possible without even uh, unlocking the phone or anything or knowing the pin or the unlock pattern. You can like physically take the SD card out, right? 
So you take the SD card out and then you plug it into a computer and then you can read everything on the SD card, right? And usually there's also no encryption on the SD card. So, uh, so be, for these reasons, uh, storing anything sensitive on the SD card is, is a pretty bad idea uh, in Android. And we are going to see why uh, in the next uh, attacks, right? So some examples of saving sensitive stuff uh, on the SD card. This was a whistleblower application. So it was an application meant to be used in a country where the government is kind of abusing uh, the population and things like this. And then the application was trying to um, allow the population to report human rights violations. So uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the data for these human rights violations was being saved on the SD card. So you can imagine a scenario where uh, you know, in a country like that, uh, like police take your phone and then they take the SD card, they plug it into a computer, they see that you are reporting these human rights violations and then you are in trouble, right? Maybe you go to prison, maybe they kill you, whatever, you know, in a country like that, anything could happen. So uh, this is potentially a security vulnerability that could get somebody killed in a scenario like that, right? So this is a, an example of uh, why saving sensitive data on the SD card would be bad. And you can see here first name, last name, age, gender, uh, and a lot of other stuff like that. And another scenario is what happens if you read uh, from the SD card, even if it's not sensitive, right? So can anybody see uh, a problem with this, right? So this is the source code is reading uh, data from the SD card, right? So the context is on the SD card, um, the application has uh, chapters. The chapters are text files. So the text file is being read from the SD card and then it's somehow being rendered uh, like this. So what do you think can be the problem uh, with that? Um, yeah, well, the game is is real, uh, but the price is is kind of because I already gave this before. You could already know the answer, so the price is is uh, <laughs> uh, the T-shirt and so on. Uh, it's kind of out of the question, but um, but yeah, it's XSS, so this is a good uh, answer. So yeah, we have uh, an XSS issue here, right? So what happens is first the text file is being loaded from the SD card. And then it is stored in a variable after this conversion here, and then it's concatenated inside of the HTML, right? So concatenated data into the uh, HTML. If this is attacker controlled, then this will be XSS. And the reason why this is XSS is because any any other application on the phone can write, uh, can read or write uh, to this text file. So you can modify this text file, inject some HTML in, inside. And then when this is loaded, it's going to result in XSS, right? So uh, a tool that I like to use uh, in some cases like this, where you cannot use like some special characters because the application uh, is so poorly written, like any like single quote or whatever is going to break things. You can use a uh, hack vector. So you can use this from your browser. Uh, if you use burp, there's also a, a burp extension called hack vector by the same name. Um, Gareth Hayes, who is the author of this website, uh, also works for Burp now. So, uh, so yeah. So, uh, if you use this in your browser, there's a lot of encodings and decodings that you can do. So, one of them is called uh, Evolve from Char Code or Car Code, depending who you ask.
Hello. Something went wrong with the Zoom meeting. Hello, can you hear me? Hello all, can you hear me? Okay, I'm not sure what happened, so I think it seems we're back. Can you hear me and see me? Is this working? Awesome, so sorry about that. I'm not sure what, what happened. So yeah, what I was saying is uh, basically that, um, oops, let me see. Okay, so what I was saying was, that uh, with this website, with hackvector.co.uk, uh, this is by Gareth Hayes. Uh, he works uh, in Verb now uh, for Port Trigger, which is the company uh, used in Verb. So you can use this, and, and then this is basically uh, running eval stream from Charcoal, and then you can avoid like all these uh, spe special characters that were being used here. So. When this is being executed, we can see we have a persistent XSS with data exfiltration, which is uh, pretty cool, right? So we can uh, we don't just have XSS alert one, but we can actually like read local files from the phone and send them to an attacker over the network, right? So this would be how to mitigate. Now, if you join a bit later, um, we'll give you access uh, to all, I think everybody was already given access, but if not, I'll explain uh, how you can get access to a longer presentation where all the mitigation is explained uh, in more detail. So now let's talk about sexy copy and paste attacks, right? So the context here was a crypto vault uh, Android application. So does anybody know what this attack would be? Any, any ideas? Local file inclusions, kind of, that is part of it. This uh, this local file inclusion is part of it. Um, 
but yeah, so this local file inclusion, but not only, right? Because what we are doing here is um, we are showing some text to the user with WebKit user select none. We are saying that uh, this text you can see, but you cannot actually select it, right? And then uh, using some trigger here with more CSS, what we are doing is we are really putting this, um, we're making this payload like completely invisible to the user, but this is the only text that will be selectable, right? Uh, and this is what what is doing the local file inclusion or path traversal. So um, the, the way uh, this was meant to be used was for uh, attacking a path traversal on the user interface, right? So you could, for example, uh, Full a user now. This requires a little bit of social engineering, but it's still a cool attack, right? Because you have like some attacker controlled website, and then you have a fake tutorial saying just copy and paste this text, uh, uh, and that's it, right? So you see, you just see like just select all this text and copy and paste it. So if you select all this text uh, and then paste it, instead of pasting this, you're going to paste the path traversal. But because mobile devices have small screens and developers like to keep things nice, tidy and pretty. Um, you don't even see the path traversal here. You don't see the dot dot slash anywhere because uh, the screen is very small, right? So uh, you just see this and then when you click OK, what this is doing is overriding, oh, so it, it is exporting the log into uh, the location of the application where the password vault uh, was, right? So this is open keychain. If you are not familiar, it's kind of similar to KeyPass or LastPass, a, a password vault like that. Uh, and then when you export this, uh, this was a vulnerability in a pre-release version. So when you click on OK, then it, this is exporting the login to this location. So it's basically wiping all the passwords uh, for the user, right? So you would get this message, log exported successfully, then unfortunately open keychain has stopped and then you don't have any keys right because you have just lost uh, all your passwords with the path traversal stuff so you can see this this report is public so this is why we can mention the the actual application uh, so you can check this uh, in here so this would be how to mitigate it and now let's talk about spoofing attacks right so this is about um, showing one url but then when the user clicks on it they really go to another URL. Right? So you can achieve this kind of behavior sometimes with a Unicode uh, right to left and left to right characters. So this would be an example. So what you're attacking here is a combination of uh, not uh, mitigating these right to left and left to right characters together with linkification by, uh, by the application, right? So if you send a link uh, like this, like mock.evil.org that has some uh, special characters like this before, then the victim uh, really is going to see grow.life.com, which is a completely different domain. It's basically this uh, in reverse. Uh, and then the victim uh, is really going to navigate to mock.evil.org, right, instead of, instead of this. So this can be useful sometimes against email applications, chat applications. So this would be a scenario where you can send somebody an email or you can send somebody a chat message uh, where you can exploit this, right? So this has been exploited for a long time. So even 10 years ago, uh, Krebs on Security, they had a, a blog about this. Uh, but this is worth a shot, right? So whenever you're testing a chat application. Then uh, another example that we have now is a sexy content provider attack. So this was a buzzer application with a custom URL handler. So since it's a buzzer application, uh, it has, um, yeah, actually, yeah, this is this is for the content provider itself. So this is the attack against the content provider, right? So we have like the URL for the content provider, and then we can say like uh, best articles and then parse the URL, and then we add the fields to the content provider and just insert the articles, right? So whenever you have a content provider, you could have a content provider of uh, SQL queries, content provider of files, right, on Android. There's different approaches that you could have. So it's important that you don't let like anybody like insert or uh, delete uh, stuff with a content provider, right? So in this case, this was a, an application that had news articles. So you could inject uh, fake news articles using the content provider like this, right? 
So yeah, I'll give them mitigation. And then something that people normally don't think about is that uh, on mobile devices, sometimes you can have local servers, right? So this is a scenario where we found one on a real pen test. It was a Curva uh, iOS application. It was using a plugin that was running a local server this local server was vulnerable to path traversal attacks and it didn't require authentication. So if you had a malicious application uh, on the iOS device, you could use like a dot dot slash sequences to read like any file on the phone. So you can, for example, read Etsy password as well as read files from the application itself uh, or do a path traversal to see which, which files are there, right? So. This is reading the Etsy password. This is reading the other files that the application had uh, and so on, right? So you could, um, for example, uh, simulate a malicious application dumping all the files uh, from, uh, from the victim application with uh, shell commands like this. So you could do for I in and then loop through all the relative paths. Then you can do wget of uh, the local server and then the path of the file. So this is basically retrieving all the files and then you can just read uh, all that, right? So, so yeah, so with that uh, open question for the group, uh, do you think uh, Corsair request forgery uh, exists in mobile applications? What do you think? Corsair request forgery, mobile apps, yes, no? We have a yes and uh, you are right. So we're going to see this now. So let's do this. This, this will include the live demo as well. So, um, so yeah, we're going to see deep link attacks achieving user impersonation and deep link attacks to bypass uh, authorization control, right? So let's first talk about what deep links are, right? So deep links um, are URIs that can be used to navigate different parts of an application. They can be available on both Android and iOS. And deep links can have custom schemes, right? So, for example, you can have social app colon slash slash homepage, uh, colon slash slash profile, profile picture, stuff like this, right? Now, an important thing to bear in mind is uh, you can have deep links that have a custom scheme like social app, for example, but you can also have deep links that have a normal scheme like HTTP or HTTPS, right? So, both approaches work, right? So. Android, when you look at the Android manifest, uh, the following uh, is a common way to do it, but uh, be aware this is not the only way, right? So here, there's some things that are interesting. One is if the activity is browsable, right? So in this case, since we have an intent filter, this means that this activity can be attacked by anything else uh, on the phone as well as uh, because it's browsable, it can also be attacked from uh, the Android browser, right? So browsable means that the activity can be invoked from the website. From, so browsable browser, right? So easy way to, to remember this. Uh, and then you can have this, but also you don't need it, right? So uh, in Android, uh, you can specify in the Android manifest what the scheme, the host and the path prefix are. So you can specify this, but you don't necessarily have to have it here. Sometimes I've seen this done inside of the code of the application directly. So in that case, you need to check. Well, I mean, you always have to check what the source code is doing with the intent extras and everything else, but uh, just don't rely on this completely because it will not always work. However, it can be a good starting point and in many cases it will work, right? So this is basically telling you what the structure of the deep link is, right? So here we have scheme colon slash slash host path, right? So some application colon slash slash uh, get creds and then slash user would be the structure in this case, right? So for this exercise that I'm going to do now, uh, you need to use the Periscope version from the training portal. Now, everybody who shared their email or already registered, um, to the training portal, they, you should already have access to this. So the way this works is you log into the training portal and then you download the slides from here, uh, for, from the training portal. So uh, while you're logged in uh, from the slides, you just click uh, any of these links uh, and since you're logged in, it will work, right? But if you try to W get this, it won't work because you're not logged in, right? So, 
So yeah, but everybody should have access. And then at the end of the presentation, I will explain again, if you watch this later, um, uh, in some other way, uh, I will explain later how you can make access. But basically, if you go to store.7asecurity.com, uh, in there, you can you can get all the free workshops that we have for free, right? So, uh, and that gives you access to uh, the slides, the vulnerable applications that I'm going to demo today, uh, as well as a, a recording. Uh, in this case, uh, for this particular workshop, is a longer recording that is four hours, right? So it's a little bit uh, more relaxed than this. But yeah, you need this version of Periscope uh, because this is the vulnerable version that uh, that I'm going to use now to demonstrate, right? So this was patched later, and now Twitter is killing Periscope because they say it's too expensive to maintain, maintain and whatnot. So, so yeah, you need this version, right? So first, you need to create an account, or if you already have an account, you can use it. Uh, and after that, um, we need to check the Android manifest, right? So for that, you can use APK tool, for example, D to decompile the APK, and then you will see some output like this. And then we can start looking at the Android manifest. And here, very interesting are going to be uh, all the activities that are browsable, which means the activities that can be invoked uh, directly from the browser, as well as which is the host, which is the scheme, and so on. In this case, we have a scheme of PSCP that we will be using. So PSCP colon slash slash, and then uh, the host is going to be the user. So now we need to figure out, okay, so if we have a deep link like this, then what can we add uh, after that, right? So if we have PSCP colon user, uh, and then the, this user, then this will open the profile of this user. So we are going to see multiple ways to, to attack this, right? So for this, uh, one possible way would be to use Deep Link Tester. So this is an application. Uh, you can also download it from the training portal. So just click from the slides and this will download just fine while you're logged in. And, uh, and yeah, then you can go to the way, right? So you do PSCP colon slash slash user and then the ID of the user, this will open the profile. Then you can do the same with ADV. And you can do the same with Drozer. Now, Drozer also includes uh, a scanner, right? So I'm going to show this in the demo. So this is why I'm doing it a little bit faster over the slides now, because I'm just going to explain it now in the demo. So you can do like run scanner activity browsable, and then this will give you the output of uh, the possible activities. But uh, there's two problems with this. One is only looking at browsable activities. So activities that malicious applications on the phone would attack uh, is not going to show you. So this is a problem. And, and then the second problem that we will see during the demo is that uh, the invocable, the list of invocable URIs is, is too short, right? So this is not computing all the permutations, but uh, still the Drozer scanner is a good starting point. I mean, it gives you some URLs to get started, but there's no replacement for looking at the Android manifest computing all the combinations in your head and actually testing all the combinations, right? So that's uh, another case. And then since the application, uh, the, the application is vulnerable and the vulnerable activity is browsable, this means that uh, using the Android browser, we can also uh, exploit this, right? So for this, you can just open this link uh, on the Android browser. And then when you uh, click on open user, this will open the user profile, but directly from the Android browser, right? You can also run this command to open the Android browser in your um, in your device. So basically you will have something like this, the Android browser, you click on open user, and this is going to open the profile, right? So we achieve all that with the deep link, just like that. So until here, there was no cross request forgery. And now we are going to do the cross request forgery because when you add slash follow, this particular version of Periscope uh, was vulnerable to cross request forgery. So it was following the user without any additional uh, user interaction. So we, we have to do the same thing, just adding slash follow at the end. So we add slash follow here, and you can see that we will be following the user. We can do the same with ADB, we can do the same with browser, and we can do the same with uh, Android browsers. So when you click on this, you will see that you will follow the user, right? So. So yeah, and then for the, uh, the analysis of the proof of concept, this is what the HTML uh, looks like. So we have the open user is simply a link. 
uh, with a deep link like this, and then the other one, it just has the slash follow uh, at the end, right? Yeah, for ease of access, this is hosted here, uh, and this would be the mitigation, which is basically asking for user interaction, right? So do you really want to follow this user? So with that, uh, let me first do the demo and then I'll take questions. So I'm just going to share my full screen. I think will be easier. So yeah, I think I'm sharing my full screen now. So let me first go here. So first we can go to Blink Tester and here we can do um, TSCP colon slash last user and then we need to use the, um, uh, the name of the user, right? So in this case, it's uh, MKBHD. Uh, if I go to URI, you can see that I'm opening the profile of this guy, but I'm not following him yet, right? So I can go here, go to Deep Link Tester, click on this, and this is opening the profile just fine. Now I'm going to close it again. And now I'm going to do the same with ADB, right? So if I do ADB, now I go back here, you can see that it also opens the profile. And then from the browser, uh, we can run first the scanner. This is running the, the PT scanner. So you can see, for example, with browser, we have PSCP open as well as all the links. However, if I go here, uh, you can see, for example, PSCP user is not being shown. And if I open the Android manifest, and I go for possible activities, for example. So here we have TV Periscope Android. So I can go here to Drosser. Okay, TV Periscope Android is found. Now, if I keep searching, you can see here there's others with HTTP and HTTPS. Uh, Example here, we have some combinations like www.pscp.tv with HTTP and HTTPS. So if I go here, you can see that those are missed here, right? So you cannot see uh, anywhere www.pscp.tv, right? There's no mention about it here. So just to mention that there's a lot more combinations Actually, in this Periscope application, you can see there's a lot more permutations of possible schemes, hosts, uh, and so on, right? So you have panel, broadcast, uh, you have like a lot of things, right? PSCP user. So all these have been missed completely by Trotzer. So Trotzer is not a replacement of looking at the Android manifest, but it's still a very good starting point, right? So now I'm just going to start the activity and open the profile of the user. So this is just opening the user, but again, we are we're still not following the user. And then we can do the same from uh, the Android browser, right? So if I open the Android browser and I open the user, this is opening the user uh, again, but I'm not following the user yet, right? So now we can go back now to uh, Deep Link Tester. And here I am going to add slash follow. Right? So we were not following the user, now I click follow, you can see that there was no user interaction. I'm directly following the user without, uh, without doing anything else, right? So this is bad. So let me uh, go back here and I'm just going to follow again. Now I'm going to unfollow, right? So not following. Now you have to click something so that it hides. Uh, and then I can go back here and go to URI again. And you can see that this changed again to following, right? So I can do the same now using ADB. And I'm just going to take here follow. You can see now we're following. Now I just unfollowed manually. And now I'm going to follow again. So you can see that this changed to following. Now I'm going to unfollow. And now I'm going to do the same from the browser. Right, so different ways to exploit the same vulnerability. Now we're following. I'm going to unfollow, click something else. Now click on this, go back here, and you can see that I'm following the user. Right, so now uh, I just unfollow. And then the last uh, scenario to confirm would be uh, exploiting this from the browser because it's a browsable activity. So if I click on Periscope Cross Site Request Forgery Demo, you can see that this also changes to following. So I just unfollowed manually. And now I'm going to follow again. 
just to demonstrate that it works, and you can see that uh, that this works, right? So, okay. So with that, are there any questions about this before? Um, let's see. A link to the presentation. Uh, I will uh, explain this at the end, but basically on the um, yeah, any any technical issues? So let me see. Any technical issues? Uh, Access, please email uh, admin at 7 securitycom So any, if you have like any trouble with access, just uh, email admin at 7 securitycom and then for access to all workshop materials, including slides for our recording, Recording and um, vulnerable to practice with. Uh, you can go to the store, security.com, and go for the free stuff. You can go to free, uh, and that will take you to that. So I think that answers all those questions. So if you cannot get the APK, um, you, pro you probably not logged in. But just email admin at severinsecurity.com and we'll get back to you. The presentation you can download from the training portal as well as the recording. Uh, and uh, the portal, yes. So, um, why is it not listed on Drosser URIs? Uh, I don't understand that question. So, if you can elaborate on this question, why it's not listed on Drosser URIs, I'm not really sure. Uh, what do you mean? What's the impact of this? Basically, the impact is that you could have a malicious website or a malicious application that uh, is going to make arbitrary Periscope users to follow anybody they want. So you could use this, for example, to gain a lot of followers. Uh, it's kind of similar to uh, ad for, ad, with, to click fraud, but you know, uh, not exactly. So something like this, you, you could gain like fake followers, right? Uh, doing authenticated actions on behalf of the user without him knowing. Yes, exactly. So iPhone is right. Uh, and what is Drosser analysis, which misses those URIs, the one you showed? Ah, okay. So uh, yeah, so this would be the scanner. So Drosser has uh, several scanners, one of them is one that is looking for uh, activities that are browsable. So as I explained before, what we can attack here, right, when you look for a browsable activity, this is cool because you can attack it from the browser, but this is not going to, um, uh, for example, if, if the activity was not browsable, then the, the browsable activity scanner is not going to find it because it's not browsable. However, a vulnerability here could still be interesting because a malicious application on the phone would still be able to call the activity, right? So browsable just means the activity can not only be attacked by malicious applications on the phone, but also from the browser. So this extends the attack surface from uh, the attacker requires a malicious application to be installed on the phone, to the attacker only needs the user to visit a malicious website from the phone, right? So it's kind of lowers the requirement of the attack a lot because you don't need to have as an attacker, your malicious application installed on the phone. You only need the user to visit your website, right? So, so this is why browsable is interesting. It's basically making uh, the application attackable from websites, not only malicious applications, but that is, that is basically all, right? So yeah, I think that answers the question. Yeah, so, okay, so then let's continue because we have uh, a lot more. And now, uh, of course, uh, iOS uh, is jealous of Android, right? And it wants coverage as well. So let's talk about uh, deep links on iOS. So deep link attacks to make phone calls, right? So this is an abbreviated version of our mobile training uh, where we explain this in a lot more detail. Uh, about finding and exploiting URL handlers. So for this, we are going to use the vulnerable insecure app. Uh, it's better if you use the one from the training portal in case the public one changes, um, but you can try the, the public one uh, as well for this. 
and see um, and see how far it takes you. Um, so okay, so in this case, um, in Android we were looking at the Android manifest, uh, and in iOS we need to look at the equivalent, which is the info p list. So iOS applications um, are typically uh, an IPA file, and this IPA file is basically a zip file that you can uncompress, and then you can look at the info p list. And the info p list is going to have uh, some information like uh, the bundle URL scheme. So you could look at that. And then here you will see that it has two URL handlers, Dumb Vulnerable and Secure App and Dumb Vulnerable and Secure App Swift. So both URL handlers will be usable for, uh, for this attack, right? And we will also have a demo about it in a moment. Another possibility here would be using Xcode. So if you have the source code of the application, then you can click on the project with Xcode. Uh, and then now Xcode, you need a Mac to run it, uh, but you can Google how to run a Mac for, from Linux or how to run a Mac from Windows. And that will take you to some dodgy websites that explain how to do this. I'm not sure legally how legal or not legal that is. So uh, do it at your own risk. But just saying, if you don't have a Mac, um, you, you still can pull this off with a, a so-called hacking dosh, right? So if you use Xcode, you can click on the project and then you can go to the info tab uh, and then you scroll all the way down and here you will see URL schemes and you have Dumb Vulnerable and Secure App and Dumb Vulnerable and Secure Swift. So basically you have both uh, URL schemes there. So this would be another way in case you have um, if, in case you have access to the source code. I'll, I'll show a third way from a jailbroken phone using uh, fields in a moment, right? Uh, I'll, I'll give you a bit more context about that. So this means we have two URL handlers, then vulnerable secure Swift, then vulnerable secure app, colon slash slash, and then something, right? So to figure out uh, the something, we need to look at the source code. Now, if you didn't have the source code, you would have to figure this out from the binary. So you could use some tools like Gaidra and others to decompile the application and figure this out. We cover those uh, in the course. But um, today, we're just going to show the example of if you have the source code, right? So you, you're looking for a file called app delegate. If the application was written in Swift, which is kind of more common nowadays, this would be .swift. Uh, if it was written in Objective-C, this is going to be uh, .m, right? So .m for Objective-C, .swift for Swift. And basically you do find dot, uh, uh, dash name uh, and then appdelegate, or you can do appdelegate dot star and that will show you whatever it is. And then you can, you will see the output of uh, where the appdelegate is and you can start taking a look. Right? So in this case, we're looking for the application function. We can see that this is opening URLs and then this is doing the equivalent. Uh, if you're familiar with PHP, this is kind of similar to explode. If you're familiar with Python, this would be similar to uh, split. So it's basically taking this string phone call number, and then it is splitting it into chunks. So this is going to return an array of chunks based on this string, right? Using this string as a delimiter, right? So this is what this piece of uh, Swift is doing. And then uh, since things uh, in computers starts, start with zero, this means that whatever is to the left of this is going to be the position zero and whatever is to the right is going to be position one. So this is giving us another hint that there's an integer uh, on position one. So uh, this is basically telling us the structure of the deep link, right? So we already knew the URL scheme from the info P list. Now we know what comes after, which is phone call number. And then we know the number is afterwards because this is trying to cast position one, which is what comes here to the right uh, into an integer. And then if this uh, doesn't result in any errors, then it will try to ring this number, right? So this is a very interesting scenario because it shows that if you can make a phone, uh, a, a vulnerable application call a premium phone number, this could also be a valid attack uh, against uh, a mobile application, right? If you use Xcode, you will notice that Xcode is a little bit smarter with Swift um, and the syntax highlighting is a bit better. So if you go to appdelegate.swift, you have to, again, look at the function application and, he, and here you can see the split URL logic and the casting to integer, right? So basically the same thing. So these are the sample URLs that we now know 
based on looking at the info pillars first and then the source code. So we know they look like this, right? So to confirm this, you can go to uh, this link. So if you open this link in Safari, you can then test uh, the application uh, with, this, with this. So this is the HTML on that website. So one link is going to be done vulnerable in secure Swift and then phone call number and then the number. And then the other one is done vulnerable in secure app and then call on slash slash phone call number and the number. Now, of course, uh, in a real attack, this would not be the, the URL. This would be something like win an iPad now or something that somehow is going to entice the user to visit the website, right? So, so yeah, it's something to very much. So we're just showing it here for demonstration purposes. So when you open the link, you click on this, uh, you open, uh, you you will see this, just open in down vulnerable in secure version two, and then you tap on open, and then you will see success that is just making the premium phone call, right? But yeah, this is uh, an interesting scenario. So I'm going to uh, share my screen, that's good. So I'm now going to demonstrate this. So first I'm going to show you the info police, right? So if you look at the info police from um, a computer, like a Linux computer, for example, you will see this garbage, So you don't really know um, what is going on, right? Um, let me see, I had this before. Um, yeah, I had the phone set up before, but somehow it's lost. So give me a second. Yeah, where is this? Ring. Okay, so it's working. Okay, so yeah, so you can see the phone now. So. So the way this works is, okay, so before I show this, I'm going to show, so this is the problem with the info P list on iOS, right? So we have, uh, on iOS, we have the problem that if you don't have, like if you open a, an info P list from a Mac, then it's fine because Mac has, uh, you know, built-in support for P list files. So it, it interprets them fine. But what do you do? Like if you don't have a Mac, let's say you also don't have a, a hacking torch that I explained before, uh, what can you do, right? So if you have a jailbroken phone, you can use Filsa. So I'm going to tap on Filsa and then I'm, I just tap on the icon here and I'm going to tap on this. Um, and I, now I have to find I'm vulnerable in secure version two, which is here. So if I type, I tap on the I icon. Now in iOS, we have two directories, one for the bundle, one for the data. The info P list is on the bundle one, right? So I'm going to tap on the bundle. And now I have to tap on the vulnerable in secure version two. So now I'm going to scroll down uh, and find the info P list, which is here. So here we have, instead of this binary garbage that we saw here, we have actually uh, a nice interface to read the plist file, right? So I can go to bundle URL types here, and now I have to open this item uh, zero. So I can see the bundle URL schemes, and here we can see that you have down vulnerable in secure app and down vulnerable in secure app. So this is telling us what the custom uh, schemes are, right? So now that we know this, uh, we can use this from um, the demonstration website, right? So you have the link on the slides. So now if I tap on the first link, I'm just getting opening in Dumbledore to secure app version two. So if I hit on open, you can see that the application is open and then this is calling the premium phone number, right? So, uh, so that is one example. And then I'm just going to tap on the second one. So this would be the second one. You can see I'm also getting the success message, right? So, okay, so that's about deep links. So now let's talk about, uh, let me see if there's any questions about this before we continue. Um, iOS looks difficult to pen test compared to Android. Uh, yes, there's a few problems. So basically Android is an open platform. So there's a lot of stuff is open source and it's kind of easier to test, there's more tools. 
in, in iOS, they don't want you to jailbreak. Uh, they patch all the vulnerabilities that allow the, the jailbreaks and so on. Uh, uh, so on Android, for example, you don't need Android vulnerabilities to root a phone, but on iOS, uh, you, you do, right? Uh, and yeah, in, in, in iPhone, for, uh, for iPhones, you can use uh, I, the iOS simulator, not emulator, uh, but it's not going to be as good as a real device. So pretty much every tester I know is going to test on a real jailbroken device, just because it's how things tend to work uh, better, because the simulator, uh, is running on an x86 uh, architecture. So this is not going to work as well. And in many cases, it, it just won't work, right? So you need like to, um, so the test, the setup I showed you is a real uh, iPhone SE. So I can show you now if you want. Um, so if I go here, to general, um, I can go here and go to about, and you can see it's an iPhone SE, iOS 13.3. Uh, this is uh, using her server. So I'm just using mirroring. So if I, uh, if I swipe up, I, I'm using mirroring just to show this uh, so that you can see it, right? But yeah, it's a physical uh, device. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, there was a very cool tweak uh, on Cydia for, uh, for VNC, but it no longer worked. It was one of my favorite because I hate to type on mobile devices. Um, but yeah, it no longer works. So, okay, so let's continue. So now let's talk about sexy URI schema tags. So this was a browser application with a custom uh, URL handler. So can anybody see the vulnerability here? Any guesses about what is potentially wrong with this? takers we have an answer for squid uh, yeah so basically this is a URL handler uh, the application is a browser so uh, you can visit an attacker control page that has uh, that uses this right so you could visit a page has HTML like the following image source onion browser column for squid. And then when the onion browser would visit this website, because of this, uh, it's going to uh, close itself, right? So this would be like a denial of service kind of of the browser application because it will unexpectedly, uh, unexpectedly to the user completely close when uh, the user visits an attacker controlled uh, website, right? So let me move my face somewhere else or yeah so this would be how to fix it so basically user interaction and now let's talk about sexy logic bugs right so this is interesting because uh, logic bugs are often subtle issues sometimes hard to find and almost always missed by automated tools right so this is a scenario where javascript was supposed to be disabled by default does anybody see a problem with this any guesses about what's wrong with that so this is when you looked at the preferences, the, the first time the application opens, it's showing you that JavaScript is disabled because this is not ticked. And the code is determining whether JavaScript is enabled or not based on this code. So what could go wrong with that? Any takers? No takers? Okay, so the problem here is um, there's this thing that developers use that is like a getter that by default will return something. So uh, basically this is doing preferences, get Boolean, and then this is the, the Boolean that is trying to get basically the preference for JavaScript, but then if it fails, it will default to true. So in this case, what happened was the actual JavaScript preference was missing on the XML file. So this was defaulting to true. So we can basically run any JavaScript uh, that we want, even though it seems like it's disabled to the user, right? And then this was like alerting um, uh, all the information that we're doing here, the alert document.cookie and so on. So we can see all that in, in there, right? So uh, 
in case somebody joins later, all, all the fixed mitigation uh, will be available in the longer recording of this presentation in the training portal. So now let's talk about URL validation, right? So anybody, does anybody see a problem with this? Me takers. Um, is not really XSS. Is um, kind of, uh, yeah, can avoid HTTPS. Yeah, you're thinking in the right direction. So, so it's kind of like that, right? So you have here ignore SSL error set to no, but if uh, URL.host range of string contains uh, .onion somewhere, then, then it will ignore SSL error. So what can you do with this, right? So to demonstrate this vulnerability, what we did was to create a subdomain called uh, www.paypal.onion.7-a.org pointing to a Google IP address. Uh, and then uh, when we, you visit this, uh, this URL over, S over SSL using a normal browser, you would get security warnings. However, if you visited the same URL with the Onion browser, you would get no warnings. So this was because it contains .onion somewhere, right? So instead of checking uh, that .onion location is different than not found. So this is a very typical logic bug in, in a lot of applications. You're going to have like in string, uh, contains string uh, or something like that where it should contain starts with or ends with, right? So in this case, this should contain ends with, right? So what you really want to know is if the host ends with .onion because .onion domains don't have, don't have SSL certificates, they work in a different way. That was the logic behind all this. Uh, however, this is uh, not really checking this right. So it should be checking instead uh, if it ends with uh, .onion, not if it contains .onion because then you can do stuff like that, right? So this would be the mitigation. And now let's talk about my in the middle attacks. This was a secure messenger application. So a very interesting attack. So XMPP is a protocol for messaging that uh, chat mobile applications are going to use. So a very cool attack here that you can try is um, to, uh, as a malicious XMPP server, to say that the only authentication mechanism that you have is plain, right? So you are trying to impersonate, for example, a Google XMPP or Facebook XMPP or something like that to test an application with permission, of course. Uh, and then uh, you say that the only way to authenticate is using plain text. So then the mobile app may fall back to, to that, right? Because in the normal mechanism, they're supposed to work with a challenge response kind of way, which is safer. Um, but if the application falls for this, then it may send you like the, the credentials in clear text as in this case, right? So then you could base 64 decode this uh, and you would see the credential, right? So that will be the mitigation. And then uh, let's see uh, an interesting uh, vulnerability with an update back, right? So, uh, well, this is, this is quite easy. So I'm just going to skip the question. So this was a premium phone call, right? So. The problem is the update request is checked over clear text HTTP. So any malicious attacker that has man in the middle, like for example, on open Wi-Fi or something like this, uh, they can change the page. So from uh, not found, you can say, okay, found, and this is the, the version two of the application uh, is available. This is a forced update. So the user cannot do anything until they update. And then the URL to update is this phone number. Right, so uh, we have a lot of problems here. One is that the update was being requested for clear text HTTP. And the other is that the URL um, can actually be a phone number and it's not being validated by the application. So the application was showing the user new version available. Uh, and then when you tapped on update, instead of updating the application, it was just calling a phone number, which would probably like confuse the user, right? So you can make like premium phone calls with a fake uh, update, which was uh, pretty cool, right? So this would be how to mitigate that. And now a very similar example would be what happens if a third party, uh, if a third party library you're using uh, is retrieving a zip file uh, 
over clear text HTTP, right? So in in the um, in iOS, you can see this in ATS. So ATS is App Transport Security, which is enabled by default since iOS 9, so for a few years already. And in this case, we can see in the info pill is that we have an exception, right? So we have App Transport Security, there's an exception domain. So uh, a domain where SSL is not required. And then this is saying a temporary exception allows insecure HTTP loads set to true. So basically this is allowing uh, clear text HTTP to some S3 uh, domain, right? The application was retrieving a zip file over clear text HTTP. So because this is done over clear text HTTP, an attacker can replace the zip file by something else. And then when the zip file is being uh, unzipped uh, on the mobile device, you can overwrite uh, any file you want uh, on the mobile device with the permissions of the application that you are attacking, right? So uh the the root cause is kind of similar in the case that the application is using clear text http the implication is completely different and interesting in the case where you can control a zip file that will be unzipped uh, by a mobile device right now this is uh, another interesting vulnerability uh, about a dialog for ssl warning so basically the application is going to show a warning to the user whenever uh, the SSL certificate is invalid to let the user make the choice, right? So it's catching the certificate exception and then it's going to ask the user. So you want to accept the unknown certificate always once or abort, so those are the three options. And then the application registers a broadcast receiver on the fly, right? So this is why you should always check the source code. because if you're only checking if there's a broadcast receiver on the Android manifest, you're missing out, right? So you, you could have uh, a, a receiver registered dynamically like we found in this application in the source code, right? So you need to look at the source code. So here the application is registering this broadcast receiver, is waiting for the choice of the user, and then once it gets the choice, it unregisters uh, the receiver, right? So that's the logic. And then um, the user answers basically, and this is going to process the answer of the user. And what is most important for us here, if the decision is always, right? So we have three choices, always once an abort. So if the user clicks on this always, then the certificate is going to be stored uh, permanently in the application so that the user is not prompted again for this certificate, right? So can you try to guess what is Potentially wrong with that. Any takers? Uh, money in the middle, yes. So we have a money in the middle vulnerability, but this uh, a permanent uh, money in the middle bypass, right? So you could have a malicious application on the phone sending broadcasts uh, like this, like always answering to uh, trust all the certificates always. So it's going to say decision one and decision choice three. So it's saying always, always, always trust, right? So it's basically simulating that the user is always clicking on the always. And whenever um, the receiver is being registered during that window, this broadcast will be bought uh, and it will be processed. So the user will have no chance to, to say something else because this is being happening all the time in the background, right? So that will be the mitigation. And then for money in the middle of XMPT, you can uh, try to use Prosody, right? So uh, Prosody.im, this is free. And you can say like your virtual host for chat.facebook.com, gmail.com or jabber.org. Those are popular XMPT um, servers. Uh, and then you set your virtual host for each domain and uh, you can try to see if the application will try to log into this. And if it does, that is going to mean that it's vulnerable to man in the middle because by default, Prosody is going to be running with a self-signed certificate. So this is a quick way for you to check that kind of stuff. So we have a few more clear text vulnerabilities. So in this case, the application was getting uh, XML from the server. Uh, and then the, actually this was very interesting because the application was not doing any of this, but uh, the library that they were using to retrieve uh, the XML uh, 
had this function of processing media files. So we could manipulate the XML to include this media file. And then here we could do this path traversal. So it was trying to save this XML uh, into um, the SD card, but we could traverse out of the SD card, uh, specify the <clears throat> application preferences file, and then specify the attacker um, download URL. So basically, we could get a permanent man in the middle through an arbitrary file right, right? So we have a path traversal, uh, clear text, HTTP uh, access, right? So then we exploit the path traversal, and then we can specify uh, where to download our preference file from, which is an attacker controlled website. So this uh, XML file will be downloaded by the application as the new preferences file. So this is going to uh, in turn completely override the preferences of the user, right? So it's completely overriding the preferences uh, that the user had. And one of those preferences was the server URL to where submit human right violations. So this was another human right violations kind of application. Uh, and uh, so a malicious government, for example, could exploit this vulnerability and then get all the human rights uh, violation reports sent to, to the attacker instead of uh, the legit um, non-government organization. Right? So first the file was being deleted and then it was being uh, copied over. Uh, and then from that point onwards, um, the attacker would receive all the um, uh, human rights violations. Right? So now let's talk about access attacks and data exfiltration. on Android and iOS. Since we are a little bit short on time, I'm just going to jump to the demo, I think, and I'll explain all these during the demo. Now, the one thing that I'll explain here is for this exercise to work right now, again, everybody attending this workshop should have access to um, all the workshop materials. So for this, you cannot use the public version of Androgod because we have modified it uh, specifically for this exercise. So you have to download the one from the training portal. Uh, and then first we need to create some files from storage. So we have to go to secure data storage and create some uh, user. Uh, and then the same for the SQLite file. And then we go to the XSS. Uh, I'll, I'll show this in a moment in the demo, right? So uh, I'm just basically introducing you to the concepts now. And then we are basically going to try different pillars. So first we're going to try some HTML tags, which the hello uh, is bigger. So we have HTML injection. Then we can try some alert one uh, payload. So image source one, alert one, script alert one, and so on. We get the alert one. So this demonstrates that we have XSS, but we still don't know what the impact of this is, right? So we can do alert location, and alert location is going to tell us the context in which uh, this XSS is being executed, right? So this is going to be important because if it is a file context, then things can get very interesting. So if the web view is configured incorrectly, this can allow us to exfiltrate uh, local files from the phone, right? So here we have uh, two vulnerabilities, one on internal storage and one on external. Um, so we need to figure out the paths to, for the data to steal. So you can do, for example, ADB shell, and then you go to data data was a SAT AGOAT, and then you run the find command and you will see this a users XML and AGOAT, which is the SQLite file. So with that information, we know which files to steal. So we can do script, and then send this payload of users XML, and then we can send the request and alert it. And then we can also do the same with AGOD, which is the SQLite database, right? So we can try those payloads uh, and that will uh, read those files, right? So we can read files from the phone and send them to the attacker over the internet, right? Now, one of the two vulnerabilities is on external storage. Right? So internal storage is kind of protected their applications cannot write to this unless you screw up with the Android permissions. Uh, external storage is the SD card. So any application with SD card permissions can read and write there. So you don't even need an XSS vulnerability on, on this. You just need to find which file on the SD card uh, is being used for this. And then you can inject your HTML or your XSS payload in there. And that will make this uh, directly, right? So that's an exercise about this here. Other thing to mention is that you can also 
get uh, configuration files from the phone, like anything that the application can read, like any world, world readable files uh, it can read, right? Or even files from other applications like Drosser has this binary, which has somehow read permissions for other applications. So you can also retrieve that, right? So those are other example files that you can read, right? So, so in essence, we are going to use this methodology, right? So first we're going to inject some HTML, see that there's HTML injection, then we try to get some alert one. So we confirm we have XSS, then we do alert location. So this is telling us this is a file context, which is uh, privileged. Uh, it's not protected by the same origin policy, so we can read local files, and then we can actually steal the local files, right? And then we have the XSS through SD card manipulation. So uh, a malicious uh, application can just change the HTML file on the phone, so you can do ADB shell, find on the um, on the SD card, and then you can eventually find the location of the HTML file. So you can do ADB pull, it's going to download the HTML file locally, then you can edit it, uh, and you can add your XSS in there. So you don't even need the vulnerability here, you can just uh, inject your own uh, payload there, and then as the HTML is being loaded by the application, this is going to result in XSS, then you just do a push from your computer into the phone, and then the file will be pushed. And when you click on input validations, this will immediately show uh, the alert, uh, proving access to the credentials of the user, right? If you run MobSF, which I recommend you do, uh, a problem with it is that uh, it uses like these hashes for the different uh, applications. So you can do ls with the dash uh, lt command. So the t is to sort by time. So it will show you the most recent scan at the top. And then this, uh, this can save you sometimes a little bit of time to figure out which of the upload directories is the one to deal with. And you can copy this uh, random hash to something more meaningful, like decompiled on the directory where you're working. And then you can try to find uh, the location of the external storage. This is the vulnerability, so the vulnerability the document is right. And then um, you can like keep being, you know, like this would be like how you would go about finding the vulnerability. So you can find as an XSS activity on Java, and it has insecure settings, and this is why this attack works, right? So this used to be the default in Android point four, uh, four, four point something. But then since Android 4.3, I think, or around, um, this, uh, this was no longer the default. But a developer can still enable this for any reason, and then the vulnerability is still possible on Android, right? So you need set JavaScript table to true, so it allow universal access from file URLs to true, so it allow file access from file URLs to true, and set so allow uh, file access to true. So if you have these settings, uh, this vulnerability is possible uh, if you have XSS as well, right? And then the other issue is that it's a file URL, right? So this would be the mitigation recommendation for what's said, prevention fits it, and so on. So let me just do the demo. Uh, I believe I'm sharing my entire screen, yes. Okay, so first do the demo, and then we can... So this is the data exfiltration in Android. So for this one, we're going to use Android code. So let me see if I can find it. We have it here. So first, we need to uh, we need to go to uh, insecure data storage, share preferences part one. So this is going to create the um, uh, XML file with my credentials. So I'm going to put here my secret user, my secret password. I'm going to save this. So this is uh, creating uh, the XML file. And now I'm going to create um, a SQLite file as well. So my secret SQLite user and my secret SQLite password. I'm going to hit save so you can see the data is saved. So now um, that this is saved, we are ready to, to test the XSS. So I'm just going to go to input validations, input validations XSS. And here we have the internal storage and external storage. Now, again, this is on the modified version of Android, not on the official one. Um, 
And now I'm just going to try all payloads at once since I still have some cool vulnerabilities that I would like to show you today. So I'm just going to copy all this. It doesn't really matter. And then I can explain what's going on. Right, so you can paste this in, in any of the two text boxes and so on to while you play with this. So this is, you can see the hello is bigger. So this was the um, hello payload with basically an H1. So we have HTML injection. The alert one is showing us that we have XSS. Um, now this is the alert location. So it's telling us that uh, the XSS is running from a privileged uh, context. So a file context is more privileged because it's not protected by the same origin policy. So we can read local files. You can see here my credentials. So this is the results of reading the XML, the XML file. So my secret user, my secret password, these were the credentials I entered uh, on this XML file uh, from down vulnerable in secure app. So, so from the Android, code, sorry. Uh, and then uh, in here, you can see that the credentials are visible. Now this is the um, SQLite database. So here you can also see the credentials even on the alert itself. So you can see my secret, uh, my secret SQLite user, my secret SQLite password. So my credentials are also readable to an attacker from this, right? So we can use XSS to steal local files and send them to an attacker with Android. You will get empty alerts for files that you cannot read. In this case, it's a configuration file that uh, in Genymotion, which is the emulator I'm running, it doesn't work. However, this is the file from Drosser that I explained on the slide. So we can also read like binaries from other, um, from other applications, as long as the permissions uh, allow us to do so, right? So with that, let me take uh, some question about this before we um, talk about uh, iOS as well. Jelly Bean version. Uh, this attack uh, works on all Android versions, even the newer ones, I believe. Uh, I have tried even at least on Android 9 and it was still working. However, you need the, um, you need the, the newer Android version, you need like the developer, something like this. However, this is actually possible, right? So sometimes developers have crazy features on their applications and they need to enable this somehow. So this is still possible. It's just a lot less uh, likely than before when it was the default, right? So yeah, it was Android 4.3 or 4.1. I don't remember now where some of these settings changed from default to non-default. Would you perform XSS plus open redirection attack? Uh, yeah, you could, if you have XSS, you can also do like window open or you can do location equals and do a, a redirection as well, yes. Uh, but in this case, we're just doing the data exfiltration just to keep things simple. But yeah, you could also redirect as well. That is that is actually easier than the exfiltration itself. Okay, so I think those were all the questions. So now let's uh, give iOS some love, right? So we're going to do the same thing. We are going to go to Dumb Vulnerable Insecure app for this, go to WebView Issues, start talent, and then we're going to try some payloads there. We're going to follow a similar methodology. So hello uh, with H1. Then we will try to read some local files. In this case, we're going to read um, the SQLite database for phone calls of the of the phone. And we will also try alert one and so on, right? So we have alert one, so we have XSS, we can do alert location. And here, very interesting, we can see the URL is Apple Web Data. Uh, we have a, about null, so there's no URL. Uh, and this Apple web data. So this is kind of the equivalent uh, in Android for a file URL. If it was a file URL on iOS, it would also be very bad. Uh, and then you can see here the successful reading of a couple of SQLite databases on uh, on iOS, right? So, so yeah, so we can exfiltrate files as well. Uh, and methodology-wise, you're basically trying to answer the same questions. We have, um, do we have HTML injection? Do we have XSS? Uh, if we have XSS, what is the context of the XSS? So if it is Apple Web Data, you should get excited. If it is file, you should get excited, and so on, right? And then uh, we can try to read some local files from iOS. 
And then for the root cause, uh, if you have the source code, right, you should be looking for WK web views, UI web views, and try to see uh, if the application uh, is using some of these, right? So uh, in this case, when you search for this, you can pipe this uh, to filter this down to .swift files only, so you get a little bit more cleaner output. And here you can see have uh, WK web views, uh, as well as some um, uh, UI web views uh, and so on, right? So in this case, the more interesting one is when you have a UI uh, web view, right? So I think this is uh, more interesting. So the client side injection detail view controller has a UI web view, and a UI web view is going to be more interesting because it's more vulnerable by default, right? So I'll explain this in a moment. So then this is the vulnerable code uh, in iOS. This is vulnerable Swift code. You can see that the syntax highlighting here is not as smart because this is a string concatenation in Swift. This will look better uh, on Xcode. I think yeah, we have a, an Xcode uh, screenshot. So you can see here that the backslash name is in a different color on Xcode because Xcode understands the Swift uh, syntax better. So we have a UI web view, which is more vulnerable by default is loading a user input into a string, uh, is concatenating it into the string. And then uh, another huge security problem here is that the base URL, URL is nil. So this is what is making this HTML to be loaded from Apple Web Data, which in essence means that uh, this access is much more privileged and we can read local files from the front. And so uh, this attack is possible due to the fact that WebKit allow universal access from file URLs and WebKit allow file access from file URLs are turned on by default on UI web view, right? So anytime you use a UI web view, uh, which is the old uh, iOS web view, uh, this is vulnerable uh, by default, right? The, I think also uh, JavaScript is enabled by default. It basically has all the insecure settings is, uh, enabled by default, right? The, these old web view. Uh, nowadays, uh, I believe um, WK web view, uh, web views are much more common. Uh, and also if you use a UI web view, I think you will get some warning from, from Apple uh, when you submit your application to the, <clears throat> to the Apple store. Um, yeah, and I think that is basically it. So if you are a developer, you should be using a WK web view. However, this attack is also possible against WK web views. However, like in Android, you would have to enable all these insecure settings, right? So let's do the iOS demo. Uh, I believe I am still sharing my full screen. Yes. Uh, okay. So then let's do iOS demo, right? So this is the phone and what I'm going to do now is um, go to damn vulnerable and secure app so you have to tap on the menu scroll down to web view issues start challenge and now I have to go here and I'm just going to try all the payloads at once so oops let me see if I can copy everything. Okay, so now I'm going to paste this in here. And if I hit return, now we will start getting some alerts. So this is the Apple web data, uh, which is uh, when we get excited because this is showing us that uh, the XSS is more privileged. There's no URL, we have about null, which means there's no URL, so this is also uh, scary. Uh, we have the alert one. Then this is uh, exfiltration of the phone history from the phone, as well as another SQLite database here. Right, so we can read local files from the phone, basically the same thing uh, in iOS as in Android, we can read local uh, files from the device using data exfiltration. So any questions before we continue? No questions. Okay, so then let's move on because uh, we have a lot more vulnerabilities. This, uh, yeah, well, this is actually quite cool. Uh, so, so, yeah, the, um, uh, the, the actual clear text HTTP is not very uh, like uh, earth shattering, but the actual attack here was very cool because this was being retrieved over clear text HTTP. 
but then uh, there was a, a vulnerability where this CSS was being uh, cached into, um, into some HTML that the application was using. So if you could man in the middle the user only once, then you would get your XSS to run forever, right? So you have a permanent XSS on the user, even when you lose the, the ability to man in the middle the user, right? So this was a very cool attack. So you would uh, close the style and then you can have like script source of the attacker uh, CSS, which is really JavaScript instead of CSS. And then the XSS payload would be executed every time the user reads an article, right? So this was very cool. And using this, we could also use uh, data exfiltration, right? So this is basically getting the user AP, the user agent, the cookies, the URL and the HTML uh, of the user whenever they are reading some news, you get what is their IP, the user agent, the cookies and so on. And then you could also, if the user favorited uh, some of these news articles, uh, then these would be loaded from a file URL. And then uh, since they were using a UI web view, as I just explained on iOS, uh, it was possible to read like the history, cellular usage, and other uh, SQLite database uh, databases from the phone. Uh, so, so yeah, this would be the uh, JavaScript for this, and this was the alert accessing these files. Then another thing in iOS is that you can have these tokens that basically make path traversal attacks a little bit more difficult. So, what you can do sometimes is that uh, if you have XSS, sometimes this token can be retrieved uh, from the URL, right? So, in this case, we have an XSS vulnerability, and then we can use path replace uh, and remove like the stuff that we don't care about in the URL so that we have the token, and then we can get the sensitive files uh, from the phone using the token, right? So sometimes it's possible, this is going to depend on the application, but just saying sometimes it's possible to do files like this. So this was retrieving the token and then doing all the um, retrieval, right? Mitigation again, uh, the long version of the workshop explains the mitigation in a bit more detail, but you have the slides. So now uh, data exfiltration attacks, another scenario would be uh, if an application has a browsing functionality uh, exported, um, there was an intent extra processing. So in this case, we have a, an intent extra for the query and the application is a browser, right? So uh, the vulnerability here is that it is accepting file URLs, right? So since it is, the regular expression is accepting file URLs, what you can do is save a malicious HTML file on, on the phone, like another application that has SD card permissions, and then open the browser application and point it to the file URL, right? So you can create a steel.html file on the SD card, and then you can send an intent to the application as a malicious application. And then when the vulnerable application navigates to, to this file URL, then you can try to steal like local files and so on, right? So the vulnerable application navigates to steel.html, and then you can start uh, you know dumping all the databases uh, in the private storage of the application which is something that a malicious application without root privileges would not be able to do on android right so this is an example of this and yeah here you have uh, so it was since android 4.1 right so it defaults to false since android 4.1 we had a question about this on the chat so API 16, 16 or Android 4.1 is when the default uh, changed. However, as I said, the exercise I showed before, I have tried it personally on, uh, on Android 9, and I believe even on newer versions, it should work without problems. So yeah, this is another exercise with exfiltration uh, on iOS. So we've seen uh, this before. So, let me see. Yeah, this is, this is a cool vulnerability. I'm going to explain this one. This one was, um, so you have a secure messenger, so users can send each other uh, encrypted files. But then the vulnerability here was when you decrypted the, the file from somebody else, then the file name used to uh, create the file on the file system was the original file name provided by the user without any sanitization. 
So this resulted in path traversal, arbitrary file write, and so on, right? So, for example, encrypt a message with an original file name of uh, slash 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 and then dot dot plus something else. And then when the user receives and decrypts this file, you have an arbitrary file write where, yes, everything works fine, the file is decrypted and so on, but because the original file name is being respected uh, without any sanitization, then you could overwrite any file, right? So this was very cool. Uh, and this one was also a quite uh, interesting vulnerability, right? So this was a PGP uh, client. So we have the vulnerability here, like it's uh, appending the message, right? So you send a message, an email to somebody else, and then this email is being concatenated like this. So you could send an email like single quote, a semicolon, and then your XSS payload. And then you add here some something so that you have by JavaScript. So the result in JavaScript of all this was, this is the private key, the passphrase, and then you have here your XSS. And the XSS is basically um, sending the passphrase, which has just been defined above to the attacker. And the same way you could also send the private key, right? So you could steal the, the both the private key and the passphrase of the user um, using this attack, which was like super cool for a PGP uh, client, right? So then this was like just checking with Netcat that you could receive the, the passphrase. Uh, now, uh, Smart Sheriff, uh, let me try and see if I can cover this. So yeah, this was the application mandated in South Korea. The first time we tested them, they were not using SSL. It was all clear text HTTP. So we were kind of uh, amazed about this, but uh, I mean, we reported it and so on. So the second time we changed and we tested them, we saw that they changed to uh, SSL. However, the validation of SSL certificates was uh, basically just this, right? So anytime there's an SSL error received, it's going to proceed and any host name uh, is going to return true, right? So for example, if I own 7 securitycom I'm the legitimate owner of this domain, so I can generate a valid SSL certificate for that domain, but not for facebook.com, right? So the host name verifier makes sure that you cannot provide a host, uh, a certificate that is signed by, for another domain uh, and it doesn't match, right? And then this is going to raise this exception and here, they were supposed to do something smart, but instead of doing something smart, they're just returning true. So whatever the problem is with the host name, uh, they're, they're just going to skip the validation, right? So this is skipping the validation of SSL errors, and this is skipping the validation of host name verification. So in essence, you can man in the middle with uh, a regular uh, self-signed certificate, uh, and you can man in the middle without warnings. So yeah, SSL man in the middle without warnings. Then another issue was they had a hard-coded uh, XOR key for decryption inside of the application. So uh, the XOR key, uh, so anybody could like uh, decompile the APK and then read the XOR file, the XOR key from uh, from the APK, right? Uh, and then you could use that to encrypt and decrypt anything. So this was like being everything, right? So it was kind of obfuscation, but completely irrelevant because since the key is hard coded on the application and anybody can get the application since it's mandated in the entire country, anybody can encrypt and decrypt uh, this, right? So this was the Python script that we used for uh, decrypting and encrypting. Uh, and basically you have uh, some encrypted text and then this was the key, uh, Moiva something. So Moiva was the company that built this application. Uh, and this was being run through XOR and this gave you uh, the phone number. We are not really sure why, but they were using some null characters, maybe to try to, like in case you did a strings on the APK or something, I'm not really sure, but maybe something like that. But basically uh, this hard-coded XOR key is completely useless because anybody can get it in the device, right? So the second time we tested them, they uh, started using AES, and now AES by itself is good. However, uh, the key was again hard-coded in the application. They were reading it from somewhere, uh, and then they were using this hard-coded key, and then they're just basically for encoding it and so on. But and they're using AES, which is good. The problem is the key, uh, 
the key management, right? So if the key is hard coded in the application, then everything else is pointless. So this was the um, hard coded AES key. You can see mobile cyber or something. Uh, and then this is like the encrypted uh, request. And then you run this through with through the AES key and then you get the plain text, right? So we have a useless AES layer with a static key. So in summary, between the first time that we tested this application to the second time, this is everything that they did wrong. So uh, what we affectionately call the catastrophe summary. So you have a phone number for a Korean phone number, for example, that they were encrypted this with the first hard-coded XOR key on the, on the application that anybody could get from the application, right? So absolutely no security. So this is the encrypted um, phone number. Then the entire request for the for calling the API was being encrypted with AES, which gives you the, the cipher text and then base64 encoded. And then this was being sent over SSL that as I showed before was ignoring all SSL warnings. Uh, and then you get back the response from the server, right? So really, really uh, bad, you know, like lots of uh, mistakes in the implementation. So yeah, for the fixed uh, details uh, in the longer presentation, you will see that. And these are some of the more interesting vulnerabilities that I wanted to cover. So this is why <clears throat> I skip a little bit other less interesting stuff. So sexy remote code execution uh, attack. So in this case, we have a CRM application using Google authentication. So these are very common setup. This is something you can test anytime you have any application that is, uh, you know, validating uh, some logging from Google, from the Android browser, for example, or similar. So we have a pop-up if the user is not logged in, the user is prompted to log into Google, and then the pop-up closes and sends the data to the application after authentication. So in the Android manifest, we have a deep link. We saw how to exploit deep links in the demos before. We have a browsable activity, which means this attack will also work from a browser and you will see uh, the attack in a moment. And in this case, we have um, uh, an Android scheme. So this was the vulnerable app scheme. However, uh, this is not strictly necessary. It could also be like HTTPS or something else. And this is the actual vulnerability, right? So we have a SQL injection um, where have, when the application was trying to save the credentials table with the, um, with the password, you, you know, with a token from Google, right after, after authentication to Google. So um, the pop-up shows up and then uh, the, the Google web page uh, calls back to the application using the custom URL scheme. And then it gives back the token. And then this token is being saved like this with a SQL injection vulnerability. So what can we do with this? Um, it's SQL injection, but it's also code execution because uh, in this case, they were using uh, SQL Cypher, which is actually a cool extension, but by default, it enables uh, loading binaries. So if you have a SQL injection and you're using SQL Cypher, uh, you can use the SQL injection to load binaries. So this is why this is actually code execution and not just SQL injection. So this is like doing ADB shell, uh, so basically sending the intent to the vulnerable application, logging web view, and then we have the vulnerable um, URL scheme, and then the data, and then you have here the string concatenation. So the single quote to break out of um, the SQL injection, and then manipulating the SQL query, like where select a uh, load extension of data data, just trust me. Uh, test and then this is going to load the test.so uh, binary that we have here, which we can confirm in the logpad messages because we have uh, SQL Cypher database, SQL Lite exception, DL open failed, has bad elf magic, right? So it's trying to open a dynamic library with DL open, which proves that we have code execution, right? You, and also in the error message, we could see like the full SQL query. So we can see like the injection is successful and it's actually trying to execute our binary here that we just gave uh, permission for, right? So we're giving, we're doing here chmod 777. So any other application can read and execute this. Uh, and that is basically the idea of that, right? Now, since the activity is browsable, this was a very cool attack because it could also be exploited from uh, a malicious web website, right? So this works on Android versions below six. 
So first we need a, um, a page that is going to download, make the, the application download or test binary. So this is being loaded into, downloaded into the downloads directory. Then we load our own um, our previous page. We load it as an, in an iframe. So the hacker uh, only needs to visit our page once. And then we just trigger the download uh, through the iframe in the background. And then we wait five seconds so that there's enough time for uh, the binary to download. And after that, we can then execute the payload. So here's the payload. Uh, and then this is um, just doing, uh, closing this and where one equals select load extension of SD card download test. Uh, and then this is uh, basically expo exploit the SQL injection. And we get the same, um, uh, on Lockout, we can get the same confirmation. DL open failed library uh, SD card download test dot so has bad elf magic. So this is a specific error when the binary was actually being tried to be open and loaded and executed. So, and this is the successful SQL injection update credentials health key where one equals load extension and so on. So this presentation would not be complete without talking a little bit about API attacks. So I'm just going to cover some interesting uh, attacks uh, on the server side as well. So this first one was uh, a common mistake. Uh, sometimes people try to remove dot dot slashes, but this is bad because you can provide dot dot dot, dot slash slash. And then this results in when you remove the dot dot slash here, this will end up with uh, dot dot slash. So you can provide this pattern a lot of times. And then when you replace the dot dot slash and to nothing, you end up with this, right? So we had this in a real test. Uh, there's a lot of people that have reported similar vulnerabilities, but this is a very old uh, trick that is still works uh, a lot of times because developers, some developers believe you can just uh, strip the dot dot slash and you will be fine, but you're not, right? You, you have to be careful about stuff like this. Uh, this is some proper mitigation about this you can watch in the longer presentation then uh, uploading files to the server right so this is another interesting vulnerability in python um, so this was retrieving the pgp fingerprint for the url parameters and then it's trying to run a command is concatenating the command into a single string which is uh, already bad and then also bad is that it was using the shell equals true uh, parameter in subprocess p open in Python, which basically uh, you have a lot of warnings about this in the Python documentation. And this results in code execution. So using again hack vector, we can do URL encode uh, and so on of the payload. So we can uh, do, you know, give some numbers and then pipe this to wget, 7security.com, who am I, uh, and something else. And then this will uh, URL encode the whole thing. So we have all this, and uh, here we just have a remote code execution with the file upload. So we have a nice uh, reverse shell, right? So, uh, so yeah, this is kind of you can search for uh, well, um, a Linux reverse shell one-liners, and you will have a lot of examples like this, right? But this was another cool vulnerability on the server side. It would be the mitigation, and another one that I want to talk about was the smart sheriff again. Uh, so in every classroom you have this bad child that tries to mess with all the children in the classroom, right? So um, if you are that kind of child uh, and, and you had the phone number of the child you want to mess with, you could ask the smart sheriff API, hey, I want to mess with this child, can you help me? And then the smart sheriff API will tell you, sure, this is the prime phone number. Now, so with this already, you can do some damage. However, as a bad child, uh, you know, you want the password as well so that you have like full parent access to the website. So the parent phone number was the logging, but you could ask like smart shave. Like, you know, in life, when you ask questions, sometimes amazing things happen. So what can go wrong, right? So always ask. Uh, so it was asking the smart sheriff here, like, hey, but come on, smart sheriff, give me the password as well so that I can log in as the parent. And of course, Marjorie also gave you the password. So by knowing somebody's child uh, phone number, you would know the parent phone number and the password, which was XOR encrypted. Now again, the XOR we already saw is completely uh, meaningless because it, it was hard-coded on the application. So you could log in as anybody's parent 
to be able to see the parent mobile and the parent password. So you can XOR decrypt that with the hard-coded key on the application. And then you can log in as the parent from the user interface and then say this child never access the phone and so on. So this was trying um, phone numbers at random, so I will skip that. And then another similar application in South Korea was um, a monitor for harmful words. So this one was checking if the child was using, for example, uh, it was typing like uh, sex or I don't know, whatever, you know, like kind of uh, violence or uh, suicide or uh, whatever else, you know, like words that would be deemed harmful in South Korean. Um, the application was abusing functionality intended to uh, sex to uh, text to speech to, to catch all this. Um, then it was watching the SMS and the cacao talk messages. I'm just going to show a demo about this. So this was the smart dream. So, so this is the script running, right? So you could dump like all these messages captured by the, um, you could you could see like all these messages captured by the application or by the, by the API, right? So all these messages are being captured from children phones. Now, uh, Fabian, who is the one who did this, uh, and he gave the presentation with me uh, for Smart Sheriff, he actually replaced the Korean characters with something else because, I mean, we, we don't know Korean, but that doesn't mean that maybe that is sensitive, you know? So, <laughs> because this is something that somebody actually write, wrote. So, so yeah, this, this, has, this has been all replaced with random Korean characters, but the thing is, it was possible to dump all the messages, right? And it was like so bad that even in the, the first report was being uh, indexed by Google. So uh, Google indexed the excess vulnerability uh, and then you could like click on the excess vulnerability, see that it still worked uh, and then go to, uh, go to the, you know, the, the source code of the page and see that the XSS was still working. The one that we found on the website and reported to them, it was still not fixed. So you really screwed up when somebody uh, does a pen test for you, the pen test report ends up being public and then you still don't fix the vulnerability and Google even indexes it, right? It's just some funny stuff. So with that, uh, I think we have a bit of time for questions. If you like this workshop, uh, you can get this and many other workshops for free here. So this is what I mentioned before. Um, so yeah, just go to store.tevenisecurity.com free. And now I'm just going to check if we have some questions before we wrap up. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I don't see any more questions. So. Guys, if you have any questions, please write them down in the chat. Yeah. Any question to Abraham? I'm just going to share the slides only. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we got some message, great presentation. So thank you for that. Uh, and yeah, um, so all the material for this presentation is on store.70security.com uh, and then you can go slash hash free. Uh, and there you have the slides, the vulnerable applications, all the vulnerable applications that I use to today to practice uh, and so on. Uh, since we have a question, is it uh, mandated to have a jailbreak iPhone to perform a pen test on iOS? It is not mandated, there's ways around it. You can use uh, the Frida gadget uh, to test on a non-jailbroken non device. Uh, so it is not strictly necessary. However, that being said, I recommend that you test on a jailbroken device because you have a lot more power and you can do a lot more things. So for example, uh, I showed Filza. So these tools like Filza that are super useful uh, and they only work if your device is jailbroken, right? So uh, is it possible? Yes. Uh, is it the best uh, environment to test? I would say no, right? Yes, you can do a lot of things with Frida, but sometimes Frida doesn't work or sometimes, you know, the application has anti-hooking stuff where Frida won't work and so on. And you would benefit from having a jailbroken device. Right, so I think I answered that one. If not, keep asking. I'm just checking now if we have any other questions. Um, 
I missed the beginning of the presentation. Did you cover any tools you used during your penitence? I assume you mean your pen test. Uh, um, I think so. Uh, we covered APK tool and others, but you can check it uh, on the store. You can get like the full recording. It's a bit more relaxed because we had four hours. So today I had to rush a little bit through a few sections so that you, you saw the more interesting stuff. Um, but yeah, in the, in the training portal, you have a four hour uh, recording. So a slower, slower paced uh, presentation. Um, I think I answered all the questions. Are there any other questions or comments? So I think we can uh, wrap up. Yeah, I think okay. we have one more question. One, one second. More. So for Android uh, 5, I think, use tools to decompile an APK, any tools for iOS apps. Well, I think the tool that you can use for both Android and iOS is Movesf. So Movesf is actually quite complete and it will do a lot of checks for you. Now, this is not a replacement for a pen test, but it, it will give a pen tester a very good starting point. And if you have no idea about a mobile security, it can also give you a very good starting point. Now that said, as I mentioned with Trozer, it's not a replacement for using your brain <laughs> because it will not file all combinations. Uh, it doesn't have, you know, any automated tool will not have like the business logic context of if something being good or bad, if a user can view a specific page or screen or whatever, some data on the screen, or if the data that the application is saving is sensitive or not, an automated tool doesn't know that. So it will not be able to help you with that. However, it will be able to point you in the right direction for a lot of things. So MobSF, um, I'll type it on the... Um, uh, so MobSF, uh, great tool, both Android and iOS, right? So I'll just type, just type that on the chat. And yeah, and also, uh, if you like this workshop, this month we also have a few more free, if you want to uh, attend more free workshops, so more free workshops. Abra, like, maybe we will well, maybe we will guest you next time also. Yeah. <laughs> so sure. don't don't worry. Uh, of course, uh, all the session, this recorded session uh, workshop will be sent to all, and you have the link for uh, 7A security. Um, I do want to uh, thank you, Abram, for the insightful uh, session and very technical one. Uh, of course, if you want to further ask question, Abram, feel free to contact him directly or uh, through his website. Uh, so feel free and, you know, uh, stay tuned for our uh, next meetup session. Okay, so uh, guys, thank you all. Thank you, Abram, for, for the technical and insightful session. Uh, it was very, very interesting. Very interesting. And thank you thank all you. for coming. Thank you all for coming and have a great and uh, safe evening. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye, -bye. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Thank you.